Good morning, and thanks for joining us at Lincroft Presbyterian Church today. This is Mike, and our prelude is Love Divine, All Love Excelling. Let us prepare for worship. Sorry, the sound sync is a little, the sound sync is a little. I'm Susan. Welcome to worship with Lincroft Presbyterian Church. This Memorial Day weekend, we'd like to extend a special welcome to any of you who are or have been members of the armed forces or love someone who was. We are thankful for the many blessings of freedom which we possess, purchased at the cost of many lives and sacrifices. From John 15, 13, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Our class for youth in the grades nine through 12 will begin soon. And if you'd like to be included, please type the word youth in front of your name on your Zoom square. Uh, those of you who are on Zoom, please remain muted. Pastor Diane. Thank you, Susan and I'm Diane Ford. I'm the pastor here at LPC, and I bring greetings, especially for any guests that are out there. Um, the theme today is going to be around the scripture that is about the vision that a prophet sees, prophet Isaiah. And so the topic coming from that is going to be the topic of worship. And take a moment to remember worship services special ones throughout your life, ones that you remember because of something you saw there or something you heard. Look back and think of times that in some kind of worship time made you feel something in particular. There are all these ingredients that we do in worship is telling a story. Yes, we are to be engaged with Things like praising God and gratitude and joy. And there's also a time of grace and forgiveness and reconciliation. There's all these aspects. And we engage them while we're here on Sunday mornings. But it's also a symbol, a symbol of what we do the rest of the days. So as we gather this morning, prepare your, house, prepare your hearts to hear what is the symbol right now of what we do as Christians all week long? Let us worship God. Our opening hymn this morning is Over My Head. Please, if you're on Zoom, stay muted and do join in singing as the Lincroft Presbyterian Church singers lead us in singing Over My Head. <laughs> I hear music in the 
So what do you think that was representing? Whenever we sing like that in worship, it's that element of being grat grateful. As I pour this water, I invite you to unmute if you're at home. Think of something you are grateful to God for and shout it out. And here in the sanctuary too, popcorn style. Popcorn style. What are you grateful for? Popcorn style. I'm still so grateful and, and blessed that we've had so many veterans over the years, fathers, mothers, uh, brothers, sisters, and children. Um, bless them all. I'm grateful for the, for the rain. Health and family. Health and family. Friends and family. Friends and family. Gianna graduating from high school. Yay. High school. Excellent. Good health. And good health. Jesus. Jesus, I'll add the presence, just the presence of knowing we're never alone. Thank you, everyone, for that. After we have come into the presence of God with gratitude and with joy and a sense of awe, then it's very easy for us to realize, oh, well, there are things about ourselves that really don't line up with that vision of who God is. And so we come to a time of asking for forgiveness. On the screen today, you're going to see a few prayers. I'm going to guide us through this. It's just a time of silent praying, but I'll read the screens for us. So let us pray. Lord, to be more and more like you, Christ, I need to be more... Forgive and renew me in this. And the next slide. To bring your kingdom, your kingdom, and your will into my life and community, I need to repent of, turn from... Instead... I need to be and do, forgive and renew me in this. As I look around the global church and all of humanity, I pray with those gathered here on behalf of us all. Forgive and renew us. And there's always a moment when you are assured, whether you're in the mass or a worship service in a Protestant church, wherever you are all over the world, there's a moment when someone assures us of the love that God has for us. I invite you, if you're in the sanctuary, to stand with me. 
and put your shoulders back and your head high and to be confident in the grace and love that God pours out on us. We are forgiven and we are renewed. Thanks be to God. Take a moment to pass peace to one another in a safe way. Those of you who are in Zoom, you can unmute and call out some names. Peace. Peace be Thank with you. you. Peace be with you, Mike. Peace, everyone. Peace, Peace be with you all. Peace be with you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Prayer, Sarah, in two days to be clear. Peace to everybody. Peace be with you. You can sit. Peace to all. Gracious God, as we think of this time, this weekend of Memorial Day, we are grateful. We're grateful as well as concerned for what it means to have such a militarized world. And we know that your heart, like ours, breaks at the violence, the hatred, and yet we are so grateful, Lord, that there are ways to work even as a military to defend innocent people. Lord, we lift to you our country. We lift to you the families that sacrifice. We lift to you those who come home seemingly unharmed or unwounded, and yet that is never the case. There is always wounding inside. Lord, help us to know how to be the church how we as your body in this world can minister to those who are brave for those who do sacrifice. God, we also lift to you our own congregation that as we come out of this time of pandemic, that we would come out with, with grace and with patience with one another there are so many things we have had to face. There are so many feelings we feel. There is grief as well as relief. And there has been personal growth and there has been personal trauma. Again, how can we hear your spirit as we learn how to tend to one another and to care for one another? Lord, I give, I give thanks for this congregation in the lack of bitterness and the lack of just meanness that is present in so many organizations and, sadly, Christian churches. God, we pray for the healing that needs to happen in lay people, between lay people and their clergy and other leaders. God, we pray for healing and renewal. God, as we look at what worship means to us today, lead us to be more worshipful people. Worshipful to you on Mondays and on Tuesdays. Worship in the easy moments and worshipful in the difficult moments. We want to be your light in this world. Jesus, you've said we are. And so it is from that place of your light that we pray the prayer that Jesus taught so long ago. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I am Sarah, and I will read our scripture today. God can reach us in countless ways. Key to the body of Christ is the written word, meaning the scriptures. So as we come to today's reading from scripture, please pray with me. Ever-present God is only by your spirit that we hear your word. 
assist us in opening ourselves to you. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seating on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Amen to that. This chapter in Isaiah, which we've just heard, is one of the most known sections in the book of Isaiah. And that hymn, holy, 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 comes from, from what the seraphim are saying to one another. It's written in poetic, a poem fo form as you read it. And I don't think they were speaking. I think they were singing. It describes the heavenly vision that the prophet Isaiah has when he is sent out to be God's prophet. There are several visions of heaven described in the Bible. And this one is special for one reason, and there's a ritual in the middle of it, that hot coal. There's this ritual of forgiveness, a purification that happens. The singing angelic beings have inspired that hymn. And as you really soak into this short, it's eight eight verses long, as you soak into it, you get this sense of the magnitude and the, the mightiness, not only of God, but just these angelic beings that are described. The first verse of chapter six begins like this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So who's King Uzziah? It's interesting that he is right in the first verse, and it, it does awaken our ears. In the 8th century BCE, Uzziah was king of Judah and became king at age, tw uh, at age 16, and he remained so for 68 long years. And he was able and vigorous, and, quote, his name spread abroad even to the entrance of Egypt. But there was an incident that changed the last decade or so of his life. Uzziah overstepped his bounds by attempting to do what only priests were consecrated to do in the temple. The high priest found him preparing to burn incense on the special altar that's right outside of the Holy of Holies. Now, only the high priest could ever enter once a year to the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets of Moses, a very sacred place. So he saw him getting ready to put incense on this altar, and of course, all the priests gathered together and stopped him. 
At the same time as this was happening, the earth shook, meaning God was angry too, and he was afflicted with leprosy on the spot. Therefore, the rest of his life, he was forced out of the temple and he had to live separate in a house until he died about 10 or 11 years later. Now, it was Uzziah's pride, his sense of entitlement that led to this downfall. Rather than coming with awe and humility and gratitude to worship God, he struts in there into the temple as a proud and popular and successful king. It's not that he, his act of worship was insulting or disrespectful to the priests. The big reveal here is that the king did not grasp the holiness of God. The people were concerned and discouraged when this King Uzziah finally died. They had lost their great and fallen king of 68 years. That's a big change. The familiar world was gone to them, and it wasn't coming back with his death. And then Isaiah had a vision. The vision of God sitting on the throne a throne. Rulers and nations, as we know, come and go, and it can be very discouraging or frightening when those changes happen, but it is significant. God is on heaven's throne. This is significant and meaningful enough, but there's even more to this vision, and I invite you to look at the awesomeness of God as it's expressed in this, in this vision. We were told that Isaiah, see what he sees and, and what he hears there and even how he feels. So again, it began with, in the time of Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord exalted and high and exalted, seated on the throne with the train of his robe filling that temple. Now, I've read that the significance of any king or queen and their, the train, the significance of the train, is that it's difficult to walk in them and that you don't need to walk. I'm so important and unique, I'm going to sit. And people will tend to my every need. They can do the moving for me. So it's, it's a very, um, uh, what do you call that, like public art. It's, it's a statement. No, they can't move and they don't need to. We will bring it to them. And then this connection of when a bride has a long train, that she's unique and special. She is the queen of the day and will be tended to and cared for. Remember that this vision is not about a power-hungry God lazy on his throne. That's not the point. It's putting into perspective the concern of the people in this big change against the larger picture of who is really on the throne in our hearts, in our lives, in God's creation. So what else did this prophet see in the vision? The next verse says this, above God, there were seraphim, each with six wings and with two were covering their faces, two covered their feet, and with the other two, they could fly. Now, the seraphim are angelic beings. Google it if you really want to get into some interesting history that's outside of the canon of the Bible. And they, the, that word seraphim refers to great light or being on fire very powerful. They are magnificent beings, and they get to hover just above the throne of God. And still, the posture of their wings cover their face and feet. This is a posture of humility, even though they are magnificent and obviously get to be this close to this important throne. And the sound is next what we hear about. The next verse says, they were calling out to one another, singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of God's 
uh, what's the word, glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now, this is Old Testament um, imagery going here. The worship and song of the angels was so great that the building shook. It couldn't, couldn't contain the praises that were happening. And the smoke reminds us of that pillar of smoke that followed the children of Israel all the way through the, the desert period, protecting them at night and leading them. Then Isaiah comes to a realization. His encountering God in this way brings him to cry out, Woe is me! I am a man of unclean lips and of a people of unclean lips. So out of this unveiling of the majesty and beauty of God, we realize the lack of our beauty, those parts of us that aren't in alignment, as I said a little while ago, with who God has created us to be. After connecting with that awesomeness, our creatureliness becomes more clear to us. The angels didn't look at Isaiah and say, yeah, you're right. Who let you in here anyway? Hey, Gabriel, would you please escort this man out? No, that's not what happened. What happened is the grace of God. Somehow this uncleanness that he was aware of was resolved. And it was resolved in this way with this coal, a hot coal is carried with tongs by one of these fiery angelic beings. Isaiah describes it like this. With the hot coal, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Atoned, one. We are one. You are one. You are whole and we are one with God. The seraph declared to him that his guilt was not a hindrance any longer. Then and only then, and notice this, only after Isaiah had confessed his sin and cleared of any muck there, feelings of guilt, feelings of I'm not enough, all those things that we do to ourselves, for the first time, now Isaiah hears God's voice. This is the ancient order of worship that I spoke of earlier today. First, we exalt and praise God. Second, we become conscious of our own state and our need for grace. Third, and only third, now we are ready to hear God's voice because we have been opened. Only then we are open and ready to hear because we have intentionally opened ourselves to the living God among us. Isaiah describes what he heard God saying. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. This is a common thread in the scriptures in recent weeks here at church. God sends us. We are the sent ones of God. Just as the Father sends the Son, and the Son and Father send the Holy Spirit, and there's more. Now the church, the body of Christ in this world, we are sent. The question God asked was presumably to the angels. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah doesn't say, here I am. I, I could go. I can go. No, he says, here I am. Send me. That's exuberance. I want to be a part of this. I want to be the one you send. What is it, God, to bring your will, to bring the awareness of who you are to everybody? So what about us? What are you doing to prepare yourself to receive this kind of gift in your life, this kind of vision? 
this kind of transformation that he goes through. He gained a lot of confidence in that holy space. He gained his zeal for life. Coming out of our pandemic, um, I really don't think it's going to be easy. There is joy and there is positive anticipation. But we haven't gone through this together yet. There has been a lot of ripple effects that we don't even know yet. There's been trauma and grief. And we who know trauma and grief, it, it's not over when the party's over. It's not over yet. The Earth's ice cap, even before the pandemic, was an issue. Getting clean water, even before the pandemic, is an emergency. People are still going to be evicted, maybe finally get evicted from their homes. Displaced people, millions of them all over our globe, are still looking for safety and food. So there is much that we grieve and there's much we could be concerned about as if we just lost our great and fallen King Uzziah of 68 years. He's gone, the past is gone and it's not coming back. So Isaiah's vision is a message for us too. Can we grasp what, that God is big enough for what concerns us. The train of God fills this sanctuary, this world, even given the stuff that we are going to have to walk through together yet to come. Hear the word of the Lord calling to you, calling to us, calling from the throne of heaven where the singing of God's praises vibrates heaven's doors. Let us pray. Grace is your middle name, O oh God, and it is transforming to us your power, your bigness, your glory, the fieriness of those in heaven. Send us, O oh God. Amen. During the following music, I invite you to pray, offering your life to Christ. This is a practice of the disciples of Jesus, something we do together at every worship service. It is from the place of, of belonging to God through Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit that we give all we are and all we have to further God's will until Christ comes again. Guests, if you'd like to contribute, thank you. You can do so using the QR code on the screen, the Give Now button on our website, by sending a check in the mail, or for those of you in church, there's a basket at the rear of the sanctuary. Church, with gratitude and hope, let us offer our lives to God. <laughs>
Let us offer our lives to Christ together with the words on your screen. God, God, I come to you as your child. I am ready to trust you as my Lord, my only guide and savior, my only source of forgiveness and fulfillment. I accept your unconditional love and turn from all else to follow Jesus Christ. I accept the gift of your spirit and commit to growing in my relationship with you, dying to sin and fear, I rise to new life, ready to love and serve you and your kingdom. Amen. We have just a couple of announces, announcements this morning. Uh, we're going to continue with our in-person and Zoom worship through the end of June. And next Sunday is Communion Sunday. And it's also the day we will be recognizing our high school graduate, Gianna. In addition, we will hear an update on Family Promise from Steve Intercasso. Our closing hymn today is Let There Be Peace on Earth. If you're on Zoom, please stay muted and turn up the volume and join the LPC choir and each other. Let there be peace on earth. receive the blessing this morning. If there's a hand that's safe to hold, go ahead and hold it. Otherwise, I invite you, rather than closing your body down, let's open the body up to God to receive God's grace and blessings. Go this day knowing that the God who has made us is a mighty God, is big enough for all that we can imagine and even further. That God has filled us with that fiery presence too and sent us into the world to go and love and serve. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
And the crowd went wild. <laughs> Thank you, Mike.